Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon session entitled Training for Success. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce an esteemed colleague and leader in emergency response education, Dr. Edward, we call him Ted Kennedy. Dr. Kennedy has a long career in federal emergency management and planning, both in his military career and as operations section chief and planning section chief at the Department of Health and Human Services. He is a sought out speaker on preparedness and response issues. He currently serves as the training director for the National Disaster Medical System, Dr. Kennedy. All right, greetings. Welcome back for lunch. I know this is a tough, uh, tough slot to get. I, I guess I didn't pay enough money uh, to get a nicer time slot. But uh, as you heard, my name is Ted Kennedy. Uh, that used to get me great dinner reservations here in the city. Um, and that's true. Uh, I work for ASPR, the, uh, the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response. We used to be called the uh, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. Uh, we just recently became an operating division, so we had to change our name. But we already had the T-shirts that said ASPR, so we kept that. We are now still ASPR. But even though I work for ASPR, um, uh, everything I say here are, is not uh, endorsed by ASPR. Um, but uh, more my personal background and opinions of things, and you'll hear lots of things from that. Um, we do have some learning objective, and by the way, I'm not selling or any product. I have no uh, financial stake in anything, but I will make a few uh, sales pitches. You'll hear those as we go along. We do have some learning objectives. Uh, we will we'll talk about some of the same things you've already heard. There've been some great presentations over the last couple of days. I've been listening to them and I feel like I have to send out some checks to these people for, for making plugs for some of the things that I'm going to say. Uh, but let's jump on in and have some fun. All right, so who am I? As you heard, I, I'm a retired Naval officer. I've been doing disaster planning and response for more than 20 years now. Um, I recent, I pretty much got in the business right after 9-11, so I did not work 9-11, but every single disaster and, uh, and um, uh, special event since that time, uh, I've been involved in either as an ops chief or a planning chief. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've graduated. I am no longer the ops chief or the planning chief. I am now the director for training, so I'm training the next generation of how to do these things. And uh, the reason, of course, is I'm getting older. And number two is there are no 2 a.m. calls for an educational emergency. So uh, it's time to move on. Uh, let's go ahead. All right. I've been to Acronyms Anonymous. I'm trying to quit. Uh, but I do probably will slide in a few acronyms. I'll try not to. But uh, somebody throws something at me here in the room if I do uh, too many of those. Why are you here? Why is this important? First of all, this whole session for the last two days has been really amazing. I've been impressed with the, with the speakers and the message that's out there, and it's it's all fantastic. Bottom line, disasters happen. I used to say something else, but they made me change that. Um, and they're important, and your roles are important, whether you're in the facility and just need to, to do a continuity of operations or make your, your facility and your team more resilient, or if uh, you maybe in your professional life outside your your uh, your facility decide to get into the disaster business, there is always a need. When disasters happen, animals are affected, whether that's uh, personnel, uh, who, the survivors coming with pets, and they do. Uh, there's a stat out there that says 80, I think it's 86%, it might be 87, uh, of Joe Citizen will go back into a disaster site to save Scruffy. Uh, and that's true. So if they're going to go back and get them, you better have somebody there to take care of them on the receiving end. Those people are going to go either to a medical shelter or things like that. You've got to have some veterinary support uh, as well. In my previous military experience, we used to tell a joke, and that's, you know, I've done decontamination drills every single year. I've never been bitten or scratched once. So if Joe Citizen shows up with their animals, you better have some vet support there with them. I teach that to all the disaster responders uh, across the nation because vets are important. Uh, and so I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to work with you all. You all know the important role you already play in your facilities, uh, many of you in research labs. There's a lot of not just money, but absolute 
value in the work that you're doing and you need to be able to be more resilient during disaster. So I'm glad to be part of that. Uh, let's keep on going. All right, uh, I am gonna rehash a few of the things you've you've heard before, but that's on purpose because you need to hear them. If you hear four different speakers say that relationships are important, I think you're gonna walk away from here knowing that relationships are important. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bradfield yesterday really had a great brief and talked about a few of those things. I'm gonna hit a few of those as well. Uh, Ms. Harb, Dr. So uh, Soberano, uh, and uh, Roger Laf Lafriere, all has said a lot of the same things that you may hear today. The rule, you've all read it, it came out of uh, Katrina. And I work Katrina, I lived through Katrina. Some of, uh, we had from, heard from LSU yesterday uh, and many of those absolutely lived through Katrina. It was ugly. And so that's why this rule came out and I get it. USDA was very concerned with how things turned out in Katrina. So we need to, we need to prepare better. And the rest of the world, uh, at least as far as the United States and, and you know the industries, have already been doing a lot of this. Uh, hospitals are highly regulated for disasters. Uh, they've been doing things for years. Other healthcare facilities and institutions have been upgraded in years for their disaster preparedness. Uh, my wife and I just went on a road show a few years ago when the CMS uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services when they came out with a new rule for disaster preparedness for hospices and home care and things like that. And um, she, my wife happens to know all the regulations. I know disaster preparedness. So we did a tag team road show to, I can't even tell you how many states. Uh, and just to get that part of the industry uh, up to speed. And now you're next. So this is um, this is important. It's And it's rightfully so that you should be uh, increasing your preparedness and resiliency. So, Without further ado, let's go ahead and get for it, get further into this. Um, you've already heard it. You know why is why do we do this? Well, let's jump right to that bottom phrase. When is the best time to plan? It's before the disaster, uh, so you have to do this in peacetime. You do not want to be trying uh, peacetime. Sorry, oh, steady state. Um, you do not want to be doing this when you're under duress, when you're under imminent threat. You want to take the time to go through and develop plans with your partners and learn who those partners are. You don't know them yet in, in many cases. Uh, so we're going to work on that. We'll talk about those things. First thing I have to say is define your goals. Um, define your, the scope of what you want to do. And if it's just to build resiliency in your facility, great. Write that down. Here is the goal of what we're, the, the initiative we're embarking on. Because if you don't figure out what your goals are, you're never going to get there. Um, next is um, just a piece of advice. Tr when you're doing problem solving or trying to write a plan, don't ask what's wrong. Because you'll end up playing whack-a-mole with one problem after another problem after another problem. Instead, ask yourself, what does right look like? Describe in detail what your plan should look like, what how your activity should flow, and that becomes your goals and objectives. Those are the things you want to accomplish. Okay. Um, yes, I stole that graphic from the USDA, so uh, I'm going to hit it again. I read the plan. I read, I read the rule, and this is it. That's all that's in there. Have a plan. Good idea. Um, match that to your individual threats and risks. Yeah, that makes sense. Include some redundancy because as we heard, I think that was yesterday, they're all kind of filling together. Plan A never works. Get ready for plan B and plan C. So you better have some redundancy in your in your uh, plans. Um, include triggers. This one's a little bit unusual. A lot of plans out there do not have this in there, but the rule does require that you have a trigger that says, when do we turn on the plan? And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, List out the tasks specifically and who is going to perform those tasks. Uh, and then include decisions on evacuation. Again, not every plan has that. In, the, in your plans, you have to. And the last piece is make sure people know the plan and be, people can actually do it. So it's all really kind of simple. All right, um, your goal is, uh, is pretty straightforward. It's the care and feeding of the animals in your care. Uh, with the things you do in steady state on a Tuesday are the same things you have to do. You've got to make sure they are protected, they're safe, they're fed, all of those things. Uh, and let's go ahead and jump into uh, that little thing about contingencies and risk analysis. Okay, first, I'm going to be the first speaker, I think, to say this. 
steal liberally, all right? And I mean that in a good way. Don't ever find yourself writing a plan from scratch. There are everybody out there in the world has written plans. Uh, they've done risk analysis. They've done the threats, uh, threat analysis. Steal liberally. Take theirs. This is not, I'll have a later slide that says this. This isn't school. You're allowed to copy each other's work um, because that's the key. And just use everybody else. So not only is it okay, it's encouraged because you want to have the same threat and risk analysis of those other entities in your community because you're in the same place. So if you're near a nuclear power plant, yeah, you all should have that in your in your plans, no matter what industry you're in. And we'll talk about some of those industries where you can steal things. And believe me, it's not stealing because everybody actually likes to share their plan if it's good. Uh, the people who don't want to share their plans usually don't have good plans, but everybody else is kind of proud of what they've done and they're more than willing to share it. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. Even your people you consider your competitors will share their disaster plans because people do not compete on disaster preparedness. It's not a thing. Okay. And last, you've heard this uh, from one of the other speakers. Keep it simple. Nobody reads an 80 page plan. I've written them. I know, but nobody reads those. All right, there are lots of different places you can go for um, for information. You heard a few of them from the different speakers, places where you can find resources. One I'm going to put in a plug for, a shameless uh, commercial announcement for Asper Tracy. Uh, if you don't have this website, go look at it. This is the repository of all knowledge in the universe. Uh, it's, it's really all there, and they put out new material every time there's a new threat, a new incident. So... If uh, there's a disease outbreak tomorrow, I guarantee two days later, you'll have resources on Tracy on, uh, on a good piece of knowledge. Uh, there are lots of free planning courses. You heard about those. Uh, a couple of speakers this, this morning talked about some of the FEMA courses. That's your address right there. If you can't remember that one, don't worry. FEMA EMI. Uh, it stands for Emergency Management Institute. But go and look there and look up your trainings you, and you'll see them organized. There's tons of online trainings for just about anything. Um, great place to go. And if you need help planning, because some people, you know, you didn't grow up learning how to plan or how to write a plan, there's actually guidance out there on that too. So you can use all of those resources and many others. If you get stuck, and I've had this with uh, some groups in the past, uh, let's see, I'll tell this story. Why not? The Republican National Convention was held in a city, I won't say where, um, but it was Cleveland, uh, and um, a few years back, and they really couldn't figure out how to write a plan. And all I said, told them, I had a group of them together and said, okay, all you need to do is paint a scenario. I don't care if it's a truck bomb or a bleacher collapse or a, a lightning strike. Paint one of those scenarios and then just ask everybody what they would do. And if you're not familiar, you heard the term tabletops a lot over the last couple of days. If you're not familiar with tabletops, that's all it is. Get a whole bunch of people from different disciplines together at the same table and say, here's a scenario. We just had a bleacher collapse. There's probably, you know, 10 dead and 75 wounded. What are you going to do, fire department? What are you going to do, law enforcement? What are you going to do, public health? What are you going to do, hospital? And you find out what people are expecting to do, and that's it. And if you write those things down, all of a sudden, guess what? You've got a plan. And then if you do another scenario that's dissimilar, so that was the bleacher collapse, let's do that terrorist act. A small uh, a car bomb or a truck bomb comes in and crashes into the crowd. Or uh, slightly less sophisticated, we when we did Obama's uh, first inauguration here in D.C., one of our scenarios that we practiced was fireworks because you had such tightly packed crowds. If anyone lit off fireworks in those crowds, we expected a few hundred crush injuries uh, because that's all it would take. The, the crowds were there, they were tightly packed. One little bit of panic, things go badly. So rehearse that one, ask those same questions. What does everybody plan to do? What do you bring to the fight? What are you counting on other people to bring? What kind of information do you need? Those are the kind of things to rehearse that, rehearse decision-making. What are the decisions you would make? What are the things you would do, the activities you would pursue in that particular disaster? If you do two or three scenarios, you've written your plan. 
so that's just, uh, if you get stuck, that's a good idea for how to proceed. All right, let's jump on in. Uh, you heard about this also, natural disasters. We all think, you know, floods, fires, hurricanes, things like that. But you heard again, cyber is a big deal, technological issues. When I um, did a, uh, it was a briefing and a, a, a workshop for um, California healthcare facilities, the number one concern wasn't earthquakes, which I thought it would have been. It was cyber. Hospitals and healthcare facilities were more afraid of a cyber attack than anything else. So make that part of your risk assessment. That that's one of those things you have to look at. And man-made doesn't always mean terrorist. If you live near a uh, railroad tracks that carry hazmat or near a highway where trucks carry hazmat, those things do have a way of uh, leaching out into the atmosphere, maybe a concern for you. And other, we talked about, or you heard about that uh, a little earlier today, and that's protest. Many of the work, you know, much of the work you do may be subject to protest. And some of you are on um, universities, campuses right now have some civil uh, unrest. So those are problems. And, and they, you may not think, oh, well, that doesn't affect us. Whatever, people can't get to work. It's a problem. So uh, all of those things are there. Uh, one of the speaker yesterday talked about Hurricane Floyd. I worked that one. It was a terrible storm. Hurricanes are great because they kind of move fast. You know, the damage is done. Next day, you can get in there and do the response. But Floyd sat there and just rained for days. And yeah, you talked and they talked about that. And what was the flooding problems? Uh, because we weren't used to that kind of level of flooding from a storm. So you got to be ready for all of those things. Uh, there are many risks out there, uh, many hazards. So you've got to look at all the possible things that could be there. Um, and I mentioned, it's not just the big ones. Sometimes it's the mundane ones that will get you. It is, you know, it's not a disaster when your HVAC goes down. It could have disastrous results, but it's just a bad day. And you've got to figure out how to, how to respond, how to cope, how to continue your actions uh, and support to the animals you care for in those bad days, as well as the big disasters. Uh, and you heard power is a big one, HVAC. You know, when your uh, system's HC goes down, bad things happen. Um, I can't stress this one enough. Document your process. Uh, the rule even says you don't have to document training. Yeah, I would never, never even consider that. Document everything you do. Document where you're getting your risks and risk analysis or threat analysis from. Uh, say, hey, I took this from the local power company. I took this from the local prison because they have captive populations, right? Take it from wherever you can and document where you get your resources. Document how you did your threat assessment uh, and, and document everything. When it comes to training, document that too as well. And again, steal liberally. Your risk assessment at, by the rule says it has to be individual to you, but it should be very similar to those institutions and facilities in your community. Steal theirs. They've already done the work. They've paid the engineers to do this stuff. Go ahead and take theirs and get it from, just ask him for it. And we'll, you know, that works. Okay. As I said, it is in school. Take a uh, copy everybody else's work. There's lots of people, and I will put a plug in for this. Somebody mentioned it actually in the questions about should you contact public health, uh, and there was some waffling on the answer. The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Be in contact with your public health uh, authorities because there's a few reasons for that. One of them is one, they have their finger on the pulse of a lot of a resource that you can use. Two, is in when they talked about um, the ICS structure and the disaster emergency operations centers, guess who's usually there representing health and medical? It's not a hospital. It's usually your public health person. So you better have a good contact with them because they may be your voice at the table at that emergency operations center, whether it's in the city, county, state, whatever. All right, good. Let's keep going. Uh, first thing, and you've heard this before, I'll, I'll put a little different phrase on it, and it is disaster preparedness is not, it is a team sport. We have to do this together. You're going to be facing a disaster together, so you might as well plan together, exercise together, as well as everything else. And because I mentioned most other industries are further along in their disaster preparedness plans, guess what? They're regulated and they are mandated to do exercises every year. 
And if you, they've done the same exercise every year. And if you show up and say, hey, can we throw a little wrinkle into your exercise and bring in some, some animal concerns? They'll love it. So please reach out to your partners in that that are already mandated to do exercises and training uh, and just tap into what they've already done. Save you resources, make you work as a community. Life is good. Uh, I highlighted the one thing, utility companies are a great place for threat and risk analysis because they are mandated to do it and they take it very seriously. So that's a great place to go. Uh, and there's a lot of the terminology you can use, continuity of operations plans for local businesses. That's the kind of plans you're looking for because it really is the same thing. So as I said, even though you have to write one individually for your, for your facility and your threat risk, it's gonna be very similar to a lot of either institutions that are similar to you or other institutions in your industry, in your community. How do you reach your community? Look at some non-traditional partners. Don't just look at the, the standard things. You see some things on here that you would never know even to think of. But if you're in a flood prone area, you might wanna see if there is a four wheel drive club and you mentioned, they mentioned it this morning about having a little swag. For the price of a ball cap or a little tiny patch, you can get some partners where they will love to be your rescue rangers or whatever you want to call them. But that's the way to get those partnerships started uh, and get people involved. Uh, you, we talked about cell phone towers going down. What never goes down? Ham radios. Uh, if you have some, if there's a group in your area that does those things, be a really good partner to engage with. Uh, so look at everybody. And any many of these people can be your volunteers. You're going to need some extra hands, potentially, so use them all. Okay, good. Here's how to do partnering. We all heard about how to actually, you know, you heard who the partners were you should reach out to. These are the secrets right here. Call them up. Make that phone call. And, oops, I'm sorry, bring food. You heard that this morning. It's the key. If you call your local fire and EMS folks and say, hey, I want to talk about, you know, disaster planning and response. Oh, can I bring by a couple of dozen donuts and some coffee? It's that's exactly how it works. All of these relationships start right there. Bring food and it works. I guarantee you it's how most things have ever been done. Uh, yeah. And Roger took my joke on that one, but it's it's absolutely true. All right. Uh, this one is a risk analysis. Here's how to do it. List out all of your risks. And you can, again, if you steal them from somebody else, you can look at all those threats along your, uh, your left-hand part of the screen. And then what a risk analysis looks like, if you're not familiar with these, is just quantify how much of a risk it is, how likely it is to occur, and how bad it would be. So if something is highly likely or reasonably likely and pretty devastating to your operations, then it's going to go up in that top right corner and be in the red zone. Uh, if you're in Montana, hurricanes may not make it there, uh, and they'd be lower lower in the scale down in that lower left. So um, just map it on out. And again, this is your document. So when you get inspected, you can say, hey, here's my risk analysis. And you show them this, life is good. They're going to love you. Okay, I think we'll skip through the mental breaks because I don't want to take too much time today. Uh, but this is, uh, you'll have all these slides. I'm assuming these are fully available to people. Yeah, so you can have these and just kind of review what the things that uh, that the, the slides covered. Um, you know, look at, uh, steal liberally from your community. Uh, look at your risk of what's likely. Uh, and build that network. If you're doing it alone, you're doing it wrong. Um, so make sure, you know, and, and the same thing with the tabletops. You're doing a tabletop exercise and you notice everybody's wearing the same shirt. You don't have your right population. Um, okay, let's jump on in. Redundancy, we already talked about this. I'm not going to, to dwell on this any, any further. Plan A never works. Have a plan B and C. Triggers, this is, this is important. Like I said, this is not common to everybody else's plan, but the, it's required in the rule. So what are those uh-oh moments that are gonna say it's time to turn on the plan? Um, in the medical community, you know, in the hospital community, there are things called sentinel events, whatever that bad thing is, whether it's big or small, you know, HVAC going down in your facility may be the, the trigger that makes you implement your plan. Figure out what those things would be, write them into your plan. This plan will be activated when ABC happens. All righty, cool. And uh, that last little bit there, 
Um, you can't direct the animals to the exit sign. So you've got a lot of work to do. You've got to do the care and feeding. And if there's any evacuation, you're going to have to do the, 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 the movement. Uh, evacuations, there are many different types. You don't have to necessarily leave your facility. You may just have to go up one floor. You know, so think of all of the things that may be possible. Good. Um, one of the things I did want to talk about, there was a big discussion yesterday about uh, fire and police arguing of, of who's in charge. If you ever run into that scenario, and I have, change the question. Don't ask who's in charge. Ask who's responsible. You get a different answer. It's always a good trick. Um, but again, uh, the rule says establish by position or by name who is responsible for what. That's important because think about it. As I said, these are animals. You're going to have to to make sure that somebody is designated to do certain things. And um, if that's whatever that action is, it's not just you know pulling animals and moving them from from one place to another. It could be turning off the medical gases. It could be you know, we talked about the generator. Having a generator is great if you have somebody who knows how to turn it on. Uh, so designate who can do those tasks uh, and identify them specifically. And I read that as being 24 hours. Uh, there was a question this morning about, well, what about the students who just come in on the weekends and things like that? If they're going to be people who you want to do a task, they've got to be trained. Uh, they're the ones. And so who's going to do all those tasks any time of the day or night uh, that need to get done. Cool. Let's go. All right. What do we want to say? Uh, and I mentioned this document everything. And yes, I wholeheartedly agree. 30 days is tough. Uh, I, you know, if I were King, I would never written 30 days into that plan. Uh, but I don't work for USDA. I want to make that clear. Um, <laughs> so, and no offense to my colleagues over there. Uh, but, uh, yeah, 30 days is tough. I wish they would change that one. Uh, but you've got to train the people that are part of your plan. Do you have to train everybody in your facility? Not if they're not part of your plan. And if they're not, that's okay. Just document who's part of the plan, who's not. And those are the people you worry about. Oh, I threw this in there for pure, pure, com pure comedy genius. Um, the estimate it takes one to two hours to create your contingency plan I've been a professional planner, both in the military and the federal government for 35 years. If you wrote your plan in an hour, that's what it's worth. Um, it takes, uh, it's gonna take a lot more time. It's gonna take a few hours just to figure out who your partner should be and to call them and contact them. It's a lot of work. Planning is not easy, but as I say, uh, one of those military terms, sweat saves blood. All the preparedness you do up front will save a lot of valuable time later. You think it's expensive to write up this plan? Try not having one. That gets expensive. All right. Now we're jumping right into the training piece. Um, I'll save you a lot of time and effort. There is lots of different trainings that are effective for different types of activities and different types of knowledge and skills acquisition. Quite simply, the things that are required in the rule are that the people you have written into your plan know how to do certain skills and activities and uh, in order to get whatever it is you need done. The best way to train skills is with drills. Uh, I'm going to use some, some hospital type uh, analogies. When I worked in the ICU a gazillion years ago, we had crash cart drills and you had to, everybody had to work on that crash cart, know where the innovation tubes were, know where the, uh, you know, the defib was, know all of things and grab it quickly. So when you need to do those type of activities, you're, you're going to be working with your staff to perform the skills that they need to do in a disaster plan or a contingency plan. The best way to train that is through drills. You don't want to watch a video for how to, you know, find, turn off the medical oxygen or unplug something or turn on a generator. That's not going to help you. You need to do some physical things with people. It's both training and validation that they can do it. Do that with drills. The other piece is uh, absolute gold on the bottom. Everybody's worried about, you know, will the people be able to perform or remember what they're supposed to do? Because I don't do this drill every week. I only do it a few times a year. And somebody said, uh, I think yesterday, maybe doing an annual drill, uh, do them a lot more often than that. Because if you really want that, that behavior to stick, you got to do them more often. But uh, high tech, have a phone app, 
individualized to that person that says in a disaster, oops, sorry, here are the things you have to do. And just a little list. If you want to go low tech, you put it on the back of their ID badge, just a nice little list of your responsibilities that you have to do during a disaster or contingency, you know, turn off the lights, call 911, whatever it is, but put that on there because that way when the disaster happens or when the power goes out, you look at your ID card and you say, okay, I remember I need to do, you know, I would have forgot step three if I didn't, wasn't written down. So that is just one of the things that I would highly recommend you do. Great. All right. This goes beyond the rule. All right. Now, if you want to train to the rule, then we can cover it. Do your drills, identify the people who have tasks to do, identify those tasks and the responsibilities, and then train them to those tasks. Uh, but if you want a real contingency plan, it's going to take a little more than that. And just think of it this way. Ask the question, what are the things you do on every single Tuesday? And how will you do them when it's more difficult, when you don't have power, when supply chain gets interrupted, when there's, you know, when you've, you know, all the things you have to do, you have to do care and feeding for the animals under your care. So how are you going to do those when the first plan isn't there? Um, and, oh, as a bonus, um, I, you have a supplemental brief that will be available to you that matches, that essentially is all the possible competencies or the selected competencies that will take medical personnel and turn them into disaster medical personnel. That's just a bonus that comes along with this, a set, uh, along with a set of steak knives. Uh, there's no steak knives. But in, you know that's something you'll have uh, available to you. I'm not going to brief it here. I will touch on a few of those things. Uh, but it is a, uh, it's a good idea if, any, if you want to turn your, med your medical personnel into disaster medical personnel, what are the things they need? And we'll touch upon a few of those uh, here in the next few minutes. So here are the broad categories of things that it would take to turn a medical personnel into a disaster medical responder. If you look at that, you'll notice there's not a whole lot of clinical stuff there. Uh, maybe one or two, you know, certainly the clinical one, a little bit of maybe the patient movement. Um, and the assessment isn't patient assessment, it's more situational assessment, but most of the things you're going to have to teach clinicians is not clinical. It's teaching them about disaster response. And if you do that, then they can become capable in a, a disaster response. So again, this is the extra credit work, but it's uh, certainly, it would behoove you to do that. Um, the, the brief that you have, or that will be available to you, maps out things in the categories of, uh, of competencies, then, then smaller domains, and then the actual competencies. I know that's boring. This was a dissertation. So um, bottom line, what's different? What do you have to do different in a disaster? That's the things you train people on. And we'll hit upon a few of those in just a minute. Uh, for clinical competencies, what kind of patient presentations? Are you gonna be working with animals that need to be washed or decontaminated? Are you gonna be working with some that are uh, victims of burns? What kind of things are gonna be different than your daily practice that you would have to work on? Triage is one of those that's usually specific to disaster response. Most people do not do triage in their daily life, uh, but in disasters, you always have more need and less resources. And that way you have to do those decision trees of what am I going to do to triage these uh, in an ethical way. And also important for you is that last bullet, what are the public health consequences of things that go on in your facility? Uh, some of your research animals are not, you know, maybe involved in things that you don't want released into the general public. Uh, so I'm not, I don't know everybody's business, but I'm sure there are a few people out there you don't want the, some of the things that those that are involved with those research animals out there uh, with everybody getting exposed to. But those are important things to consider. This is an important one. Uh, one of those clinical considerations is the psychological aspect. Uh, and I don't mean for, I mean it for staff. It, it, you know, it's, it's the people who have to do this. Um, somebody mentioned yesterday culling operations, depopulating. That's hard. That's really hard. And you need to keep your disaster responders and your staff, I don't want to say fresh, but capable. They got to be able to work tomorrow. So you have to look out for those psychological, you have to look out for their psychological well-being. 
uh, and the things you need to know specifically, and you should write into any good disaster plan, is educate people on the signs and symptoms of where somebody might need uh, need some assistance, and how are you going to get that. There is plenty of resources out there for psychological first aid. There are some free trainings out there you can you can access. Uh, and it's certainly something that you should consider for your staff because they are going to get into some work that um, that isn't all that friendly. All right, jumping on, and I'm not going to hit on too many of these. I've, I've pulled out a few highlights of things uh, that we'll talk about. But as I said, most of this isn't clinical. It's not you're not teaching clinicians to be clinicians. Um, there are many things that you'll need to know that are different in disaster response. Um, Dr. Soberano talked about, uh, you know, the uh, ICS, the Incident Command System, and the National Response Framework, and that was also mentioned from from Roger's brief. Uh, I have to send them a check for those things because they're they're important, and that the reason they're important is because inside your facility, you kind of know your organizational structure, you know who the communication works. Outside your facility, it works like this. It works through, once there's a disaster response uh, set up and there's an emergency operations center, they are going to follow what's called NIMS, the National Incident Management System. I don't care if you're, if you're in Maine or California, everyone follows the same system. Um, and I'll, I will put in a shameless plug here. There's, uh, in the latest version of it, there are quite a few health and medical references in the National Incident Management System. My fingerprints are all over them. I wrote most of those. So it's good to, you know, and, and what I would say is um, if in your world you see areas where it needs to be included more in there, please send that back to us because it gets rewritten every few years. And uh, I'm on the panel, so I can, I can plug in some things. Um, so with that, you have to be able to speak the language. Uh, if you walk in there, and it's it's really easy. You take a couple of those courses, the the ICS 100 and 200. 200 is the best. Uh, if you take 200 and understand it, you will understand all you need to know about incident management in the United States. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, you know, a, a large hurricane that affects two states or if it's just a small town fire. It's all everybody uses ICS and NIMS, sorry, acronyms, Incident Command System and the National Incident Response System, uh, Incident Management System, I'm sorry. Um, so know those things. And here's something, even in your own facilities, in your own um, infrastructure, they may have disaster plans that you don't know about. So you've got to get involved in that. They may be setting up, your institution may set up an emergency operations center somewhere in your facility where they're going to manage that disaster. If you don't have a voice at that table, bad things happen. So you've got to learn what their plans are for disaster management and how to get involved in them. Uh, so those things within your facility, on your campus, get to know all those partners and what they plan to do in a disaster, including if you have local security, if, you, if you've got local fire and EMS, great. Uh, and then outside your facility, uh, you've got to learn with work with the local community and uh, find out who public health is, find out who fire and EMS are, get to talk to them, get to know them. Um, you know, there's a phrase, I'll, I'll, you'll see it here later, but the disaster site is never the place to be exchanging business cards. Get to know those people every single day so that they know who you are and they're familiar because I've, I've worked so many disasters. If somebody calls me up and says, I'm Joe so-and-so from here and here, I don't care. Uh, my, my focus is on what I'm doing. But if I get that same call that says, hey, it's Mary. Remember we met at that training thing last year? I know who you are. I know what you do. And that way you get in the door faster. Uh, that's the only way this works. Okay, cool. Let's move on. Resource management, I can't say enough about this. In every single disaster, you don't have enough stuff and you need to ju judiciously figure out how you're going to use your stuff and how you get more stuff may be very, very different. You, you heard yesterday, have that list of your vendors and their, their call information, have secondary vendors. Well, guess what? In a big disaster, your vendors may not be able to supply anything, but your emergency operations center, whether it's at your state or county or, or local, they may be able to get you the resources because there is a logistics desk at that emergency operations center that specializes in, in accumulating the things that are needed for the disaster. If you've got a voice at the table, 
you can get that in. And you may not have to be at the table. I'm not saying every, because you can't have every single person at a table. Uh, but if you have your voice and you find out the public health entity is the one who sits there and works at the EOC, Emergency Operations Center, uh, then that's the person you want to be able to communicate with. Get them on speed dial. All right. What else are we going to talk about? Let's find out. Uh, here, I get to make a couple of pitches. All right. Get ready for the sales pitch and recruiting. My esteemed colleague and good friend, uh, commander and doctor, uh, Wanda Wilson-Egby, is the lead for the National Veterinary Response Team. Um, they are your federal veterinary resource. So when a, a disaster is big enough and they call in the feds, there is a resource out there with veterinary care and experts, uh, both veterinarians and technicians. And some of these are really high speed people. Uh, and you can reach out and get those. If you have any questions about the NVRT, talk to Wanda. She is, she is the, uh, she's not the queen. She is the empress of all things ND <laughs> NVRT. Um, and the other pitch I'll make is for the Medical Reserve Corps, MRCs. Uh, every state in the union has an MRC, Medical Reserve Corps. There are, last count I saw was over 100,000 members of the Medical Reserve Corps across the country. Um, Wanda has informed me that there are thousands of veterinary personnel in those MRCs. I know one MRC that's particularly, it's all veterinary. That's what they do. That's their specialty. So in your community, find out who the Medical Reserve Corps people are, who's their head, when do they do exercises, you can get involved in those. When do they do drills? When do they have meetings? What kind of stuff do they have? Who's on their staff? Who are their volunteers? Find out those things. That's part of your network. Uh, and they could easily become part of your resource because Medical Reserve Corps is state-based. They can get activated a lot quicker than you're gonna get the feds to support. Um, so, and they're volunteers, they're free. And just a little plug for them as well. Uh, the medical folks do a lot of, of training. If you've ever gone through a flu shot, uh, not at CVS or Walgreens, but you went to some place where they were giving them out in mass, that's usually the MRC. That's one of the exercises they do. And it has a dual purpose. One, it gets flu shots done, good for public health. But if we ever had to do another infectious disease where we have to give out mass prophylaxis, they're now trained on how to do it. So that's the, uh, that's the benefit there. So shameless plugs for the MRC and for uh, the NVRTs and yes, lots of acronyms. Um, anything else I wanna cover on that slide? Uh, I do talk about in, uh, NGOs, other volunteers. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And uh, as I said, resources are completely different in disasters. Uh, as are organizational structures. We will skip the mental break, but feel free to steal these slides. And uh, when I say steal liberally, steal from me. So go ahead and use these for any time you, uh, you possibly need them. Um, let's jump into the next group of things. And this is assessment. This again, is not patient assessment. It's figuring out how to do the assessment of what is going on. Because again, in a disaster, that's different. Where are you going to get your information from? Uh, and if there's a formal disaster management uh, organization set up, that's the best place for your information because they're going to have information from everyone out there. You heard it uh, this morning, you know, ICS, the incident command structure is set up to make the flow of information happen. I used to have, this is pre-COVID. Uh, one of the things I used to say all the time is disasters are never about resources. It's about coordination and communication. If you can beat those things, you can beat any disaster. In COVID, eh, the rules got broke because we did run out of resources. Uh, but everything else up until that time, floods, fires, hurricanes, earthquakes, you name it, it was never about a, a shortage of resources. It was just doing the coordination to get the right thing to the right place. All right, I'll tell a quick story. Um, Katrina, and I know I'm dating myself. I don't know what, how old some of the people are on the, uh, on the call, but I'll tell this story. You may or may not remember this, but in Katrina, the mayor of New Orleans got on TV, national TV, and said, send everything. Was that a good idea? Yeah, a terrible idea because people did it. And there was, this, there was this church group up in Minnesota that said, we need to help all of these suffering people down in New Orleans. 
And they got together a drive and they packed up an entire truck of gloves and scarves and mittens. And does anybody remember, does anyone remember when Katrina happened? It was August. If you've ever been to New Orleans in August, you know that that was worthless. And, and it was worthless for so many reasons. One, it created more work. This truckload of stuff showed up and then somebody had to deal with it. Uh, and two, it wasted the resource. That truck could have been used to bring in baby formula and pellets of water and the things they really did need. Um, so it's communication is everything. And that's why our whole incident management structure is set up the way it is. Because if you can win the battle with co coordination and communication, if you can figure out what it is you need, uh, then you, you will beat just about any disaster. Um, there's never a shortage of there, you know, in Katrina, there was no shortage of baby formula. You just had to get it to the right place and you had to know that that's what they needed. Um, I have a few other stories. Uh, some I'll tell, maybe I won't. In any case, um, that's what situational awareness is all about, is learning where you can get the right information. If your staff comes up to you and says, hey, I got this off of Reddit, you're behind the curve, all right? You're, you're going to be, it's going to be a bad day. Uh, get your information sources from the right place and be able to figure out how you're going to get situational awareness and how you're going to provide it. If you're the one who is witnessing something bad happening, then you need to be able to get that up through that organizational structure to make sure the right people can make the right decisions on it. Uh, and the last thing is critical thinking. You heard this one yesterday. I thought it was a great concept to stress, and that is educate people on your values, on your priorities, on what your mission is overall in big terms, so that when they have to make those critical decisions, they have a basis for it. It's not just making stuff up. Um, so critical thinking and problem solving are skills that you must teach. Oh, you know what? I should have advanced the slide. I'm talking about this stuff already. Sorry about that. Okay, so everything I just said goes for this. No, all right, so let's, uh, but there you go. There's That's the information you need to have. Let's go ahead and talk about the next one. In human medicine, we do a lot of what we consider patient, uh, patient movement and patient tracking. Guess what? In veterinary medicine, especially in research labs, you need to do that too. If you have to evacuate your facility, even if it's only going up two floors, you have a lot of research animals. One monkey or one rat is not the same as another. You know that. So you need to be able to establish a way to track their movement. And I don't care how you do it, you know, low tech, slap a little, you know, label on the cage or whatever you're doing, but you better have that in your plan. How are you going to track the animals you have in, in a research facility to make sure they don't commingle, that they don't go astray uh, into somewhere else, get filed off, you know, and end up in a general animal shelter somewhere? That would be bad. Um, so figure that into your plan, how to track the animals that you may have to move or evacuate, uh, because that's important. In, in, the, in the people world, we give people bracelets with barcodes. We do all kinds of things. In Katrina, a uh, fun little story, the most successful facilities are, let me back up. Hospitals, as I mentioned before, are pretty well regulated and pretty well prepared. Guess who's not? everybody else in the healthcare facilities. So nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, things like that are not near as regulated as, as hospitals are, or medical centers. Um, so when we did a lot of evacuation of, of human patients from, from nursing homes, guess what? A lot of them suffered from dementia. So how did you identify them? How did you track them? How did you, you know, list what, what, uh, what meds they were on and what their treatment protocols were? Well, the smart facilities literally taped their medical record to their back and, and sent them on a plane to be transported somewhere else. And it was brilliant. On the other end, this is in the days before electronic medical record, you could pull off their thing and you get the right name because some of them didn't know. Uh, and you had their, their treatment protocols all written out. Life is good. Uh, another quick story on that. Electronic medical, medical records are wonderful. I'll make a plug for that. You had the brief on, on cyber and systems yesterday have your all of your information somewhere that is resilient to the disaster. 
if all of your all of your very valuable research information is on one person's laptop and that laptop is three foot underwater, it's a bad day. Uh, make sure it's blacked, backed up to a cloud, put on a server somewhere else in another building, uh, however you do it, but make sure your information, because it's valuable, the work you do is very valuable, make sure it's backed up somewhere else. Um, again, that's got to be part of your plan. You've got to have information systems as part of your plan and address that. All right, uh, let's talk about things. We talked about patient tracking and I kind of went down the rabbit hole. This is really important. Okay, if you're bringing your staff for, for a disaster and they're going to execute your, your uh, disaster plan or your contingency plan, and if their family is in jeopardy, how much dedication and focus are they going to have on the job? I absolutely stress this. Preparedness for your facility is preparedness for your staff and preparedness for their families. Because if they're focusing on their family's welfare, they're not focusing on the job they're doing for you. Uh, so make sure they all have preparedness plans. Require it. Say, it, write it into their, their job description that says, to work in this facility, you must have a family preparedness plan. Why not? Do it. Uh, and help educate them on what that means and what has to be involved in that. Um, I'll tell another quick story. I, I mentioned um, my wife and I did a road show going out to hospices and a few other places uh, to work on their preparedness plans. And one, there was a, um, there just happened to be a hurricane that came through Florida and Georgia and we had a, a handful of folks at a conference. And so we just put them together in an ad hoc focus group and said, what did you do? What were you, how did you survive the storm? What were the best practices so that we can write those down and proliferate it across the system and teach other people those best practices? And some of the answers were great. One, one of my favorites, which probably doesn't have too much uh, bearing on your world, but I'll tell it because it's a good story. And that was, one of the hospices actually contracted with a tow truck. And we said, why do that? And they said, because most of our work is visiting. It's not in a facility. We do visiting to, to different places. And every time a nurse goes out after a storm, they get a flat tire. And if we, if we have them sitting there waiting for AAA, that's an hour and a half that they're not treating a patient. So we contract it with our own tow truck. And they go out and respond immediately to the stranded nurse, fix the car, get them on their way, better preparedness, better resiliency, better outcomes. Um, that's just a good story. So the, the lesson there for everybody is be creative. Think of all the things that could go wrong and find creative solutions to them. Uh, one of the things that may be more pertinent to you, is, and that is another hospice uh, in Florida actually had a, a agreements with a local shelter where the shelter uh, would have a special wing where they would house their patients. So they had medical shelter, prearranged reservation like at the Holiday Inn. Uh, they also had a separate area of the shelter where they could house their staff and their staff's family. Think about that. If you lined up, I mean, that's the gold standard, but what if you line that up and you said, hey, I don't know where my staff is gonna go. If there's a storm, they may leave town. And I need them. So what if you worked a deal with either a hotel or a local shelter that would house uh, house your staff and their, st and their families? And what if you worked with one of the animal shelters and said, can you give us a specialized area with all the right protocols for access and containment and all those things uh, and see what you can do? You never know until you ask. Uh, but think about it. What a great idea. So let's go ahead and talk about things. The bottom line there is, Family resilience is absolutely an essential part of your, your continuity. Uh, and let's keep going. Communications. Um, let's go ahead and talk about this very easily. And that is two things. Know how your communication networks are going to work in a disaster. They're not going to be the same as they do in on a you know, blue sky Tuesday. Uh, know how people are going to communicate, how they're going to pass information, the that. Uh, that risk communication, crisis communication, train people on this. There are some trainings you can do on this. Uh, one of the best things you can do is actually practice because you can't learn this online. You cannot read a few slides and figure out how to do risk communication. You can understand the principles, but practice in front of other people and, uh, and, and practice those interviews. 
um, and be tough on the people. You know, when you have that microphone in your face uh, and they're asking questions, you got to be ready to answer them. Pre-script your answers. I highly recommend that. I think I've got that on the next slide. Um, so this one talks about communication within your organizations and outside of your organizations. This next one, write those messages, write the things you need to write before, uh, before the disaster. Cause if you're making it up on the fly, bad things happen. I've seen it over and over and over. Um, there's lots of information out there on crisis communication, some of the principles. And if you get good at this, you, you'll be able to watch the news and see them do the exact same format. Express concern right up front. First statement out of everybody's mouth, if they know what they're doing, is express concern. Then express a little empathy for those involved. Uh, be clear on what you're saying. Talk about what your what your institution is doing. Uh, make a plea to the people out there. To, Here's what you can do to help. Donate blood. You know whatever it is. The behaviors you want people to do. Put that in your message. And the last piece is always. Uh, we're going to provide updates whenever, uh, either when things become available, but we're going to keep get updating you. Here's a little secret about the news cycle. We all heard this yesterday. It happens fast. If you don't have pre-scripted missions or messages, you're going to be behind it. So in the, you know, you can say, here's what to, here how, here's how this affects your home, your pets. You know, here's how this affects your community and have those come out every couple hours because that way you stay ahead on the news cycle. Uh, if you wait you know, a day to put out a message, somebody else is gonna get on the news and they're gonna put out their message and then you gotta do damage control. So have the pre-scripted messages that you can put out every few hours, stay ahead of your news cycle. Cool, uh, legal and ethical concerns. There are regulations, that's why we're here, right? We're talking about the regulation right now. So you have the regulatory obligations to do your contingency planning. There are also ethical issues. Um, and I think you know what they are, uh, you know, better than I do. If you have to get into to culling operations, if you have to get into even evacuation or leaving a facility, uh, those are tough topics you better work on establishing what those what your values are, what your priorities are, and what to do in those types of circumstances. Those are not easy conversations. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a moment where some things you can do for online training, some things you cannot. That is one of those that must be done in person. If you're going to learn teach people how to do ethic, have ethical conversations uh, or conversations on ethical issues, you better do that one in person. Um, Okay, I am almost done with this boring stuff. Let's get in, ah, oh, darn, I did it again. All right, so let's get into the last piece and that's volunteer management, plan on them. They're gonna be there. If you arrange with the groups to provide volunteers, they will sometimes, but if you don't arrange for it, they won't. They're not gonna be there for you. So you know, I can't guarantee volunteer, everybody, I've heard that in so many plans. Oh, we can't count on the volunteers. We're not gonna play with them. I can guarantee they're not there if you don't plan on it. So work those relationships and you will get people. It's amazing how many people actually do show up. Um, and, and we heard that uh, the other day, they sometimes are a little too zealous that they'll put themselves in harm's way. So learn how to control your, your volunteers, figure out what you're, gonna, what you're gonna do with them. Do you need any special badging, any processes for them? Do you need a set of instructions for them? What do you need to do with your volunteers? Plan for it in advance and, and you'll have a better outcome. Cool, uh, skip the middle break. All right, now, guess what? We're finally gonna talk about training after all this. <laughs> so let's do that. Um, I mentioned this already. First of all, train to your plan. Your risks are the first thing you establish. What are the things you're going to plan for? You cannot plan for everything. Establish those few risks and hazards that you're going to plan to come up with the activities that will support operations during those risk environments uh, when that contingency happen. Outline the tasks that need to be performed under the conditions there, and then train your people in those tasks. That's pretty much it. And again, define that scope well, because if you start wandering off, oh, it'd be nice to, you'll never finish. You'll never get there. So define your scope well. I mentioned don't train, uh, don't train clinicians to be clinicians. Teach them in everything else. Um, I'll put in another shameless plug here. There are sites out there, uh, no problem. 
there are sites out there that not only have free training, there are sites out there that talk about different credentialing. There's this whole, FEMA has this whole network called One Responder uh, that can track your credentials. So if you've taken you know, ICS courses and you maybe are, as we heard, uh, Roger was a, an incident commander, he puts that on here and that's the way everybody in the world can know it. Because mm -hmm. otherwise somebody can show up and we had this in Katrina uh, and many other disasters that you know, somebody gets on the phone and says, hey, hey, I'm a, a pediatric surgeon, I can help. You could be a plumber for all I know. I, I have no idea who you are, but there is. this is a way to track people's credentials when it comes to disaster management. And there are other ways to track. We have ways to track uh, people's credentials otherwise. For all of you licensed providers, somewhere in your state licensure, there was probably a little check mark that said, would you be willing to volunteer for disasters? And if you check that box, I know who you are. We already have you in the system. It's the system's called ESARVIP. It's emergency registry or advanced registration of healthcare people. Um, I don't worry about what the acronyms stand for. I just know what they mean. But um, that is a way to check people to find out who they are. And if a volunteer shows up, then you got to know who they are and how to validate their credentials. Really good people who are professional disaster responders literally carry paper copies of everything with them, their licensure and everything else. Uh, so when they show up, they can show you, yes, I am an, an actual veterinarian. All right, let's go ahead and talk about other stuff. I mentioned this already. If you're teaching skills, if you're teaching a, a set of processes that you want people to physically perform, the best way to do that is through drills. Uh, we talked about the crash cart drill. Uh, it, it's essentially, you know, you're... Um, it's the this you know it's the school fire drill you remember when you were in first grade and second grade and they they taught you how to do a fire drill it's the same thing for adults here are the actions you must do in this disaster or in this contingency and you just practice it and you practice it sometimes with notice and sometimes without notice and all of a sudden your staff are capable of executing your contingency plan because you drilled it uh, and again I would not recommend doing that annually you got to do it a few times. Uh, just to make sure that that sticks. And again, have your cheat sheet on the back of your ID card or on a phone app uh, so that people know, all right, something bad happened. I'm not thinking straight. Oh, I can do these five steps that I have to do. All right, let's talk about other types of things. Online training. Online training is the norm now because it's cheaper. It's easily accessible. You can get it anytime, you know, people can access it at 10 o'clock at night. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about online training. Even when I got into my, uh, my doctorate in education, I was, I kind of poo pooed the idea of online training. I thought it was second rate. It's not, it's just that we've all had bad training. Uh, if you do it right, then it actually, in some cases, can actually be better than in-person training. And I'll talk about that just a little bit. Um, but here are the rules. It's got to be engaging. Um, it's got to involve the people. The problem with, you know, even this format, I'm spood feeding you information. You're not involved. If you're paying attention, great. But if you're not, so what? But if it was an online session where you have to interact with the content. And I say, here's a principle and I talk about it or you read about it on the online session. And then uh, in the next slide, you've got to do something with that and match up a definition to something. You're going to absorb it better. Um, one of the other things, I don't know if I have it on this slide, but it's coming up later. Um, let's see, got to get to where I'm at. All right. So yeah, no, we talked about it. use use games, use gimmicks, use little things that that are going to capture people's uh, attention in their online training. Um, and if you have money or you're in some grant program, get somebody to design a game for you. Nothing better than that. That's amazing. And we will hit on that one a little bit later. But most of us don't have any money, so you got to do the little tricks uh, of literally just you know playing Jeopardy, whatever it takes to keep people engaged with your content is important. Uh, principles of online education, you can Google this. Uh, always don't Google, go to Google Scholar, get the real articles, the research stuff. Don't go to, you know, what Sally at 3M4, you know, said, go to the real, real articles in the studies. 
um, on adult education has to be engaging. You've got to be able to say right up front, what's in it for me? Why do I care about this? And tell them that right up front. Um, it's uh, make sure you focus on behaviors. And in this, exactly what the rule calls for, you're focusing on skills and behaviors, what people are going to do. So that's something that lends itself to, uh, to the kind of training that we're looking at. Um, tell them what the learning objectives are up front. Uh, break it up into little bits of, of knowledge. That's why in this presentation, I, I have those little knowledge breaks because you know the fire hose just can't keep rolling and rolling. Uh, you really should take those little breaks. We didn't do it here in the interest of time, but I would normally do those kind of things. Break up that training so that people have a second to reflect on what they just heard. Um, and as I said, use some activities. That last little bullet there, and this is one I'm gonna make a pitch. Um, the last two bullets. The things that you read right now, you read professional journals, right? When was the last? I mean, I don't, I haven't seen a paper copy of a professional journal in a long time. I read them all online. So online learning is very good for information gathering for the same types of things you would do with reading, you can be doing with online learning because it's the same cognitive functions. Um, and as I mentioned, some cases online learning is better. And one of those is knowledge discovery. If I'm spoon feeding you information about something, you may absorb it, you may not. If instead in an online platform, I said, here's a scenario, go find five research articles and, sim and, and synthesize the information to come up with a response to these three questions. You are discovering the knowledge and it's far more active learning than it is with anybody doing a lecture. Uh, so sometimes online learning can actually be better than not. In this situation, uh, for, for the skills that you're trying to do to meet the rule, those are skills, do drills. For other types of information that you want people to learn for other pieces of your contingency plan, you can do online learning, except, and I'll talk about that right now, I think. All right, here's where online learning is not necessarily effective. It's not well suited for this. There are three basic elements. One is things where you need tactile skills. Uh, anything where you're touching a piece of equipment, anything, like I said, you don't want to be teaching somebody online how to turn off the medical gases. You got to do that. You have to physically do that. Um, I always uh, use the example, you can't learn to start an IV without an arm. You got to physically do that. Uh, we teach people how to set up field uh, environments, uh, tents and shelters. You can't do that in a video. You can watch a video, but until you actually put your hands on the tent poles and, and pull the canvas, you don't know what you're doing. So some things, anything that requires tactile uh, knowledge, you know, muscle memory, those things must be taught in person, or I should say are better suited to be taught in person. Um, the next is those kind of skills that need direct supervision and immediate feedback. A couple of examples I always use is when I learned how to do work in sterile fields, that's something that somebody's looking right over your shoulder and saying, no, you just contaminated yeah. something. And if you don't, you can't do that online. You, you just, you know, I guess technically you can have cameras and all kinds of things, but that's the best thing to do in person because you need to be able to have Direct, feed, or direct observation and immediate feedback. Um, and one of the other things, and I know this is done, how many people have seen online training for how to don and doff PPE? Again, I would, I would highly recommend you do that one in person because you've got to have somebody standing right next to you that says, nope, you goofed. Uh, and if you don't get that, you don't learn how to do it well. So that was one of the other areas. And the last is those highly sensitive, highly cognitive levels, things like ethics, uh, things like leadership. Leadership is really hard to teach online. You can learn some concepts, but you've got to, you know, be in person, do all of the, the body mechanics and see, you know, every, every possible way of communication uh, to do those things. Um, interviews are another one. If you have to do family interviews, if you have to do interviews for the press, uh, we have a good example. One of the one of the folks in our group are uh, fatality management people, and in a disaster, um, here I'll back up just a little bit. The National Transportation Safety Board has an MOU with us to do victim identification anytime there's a plane crash, train plane or train crash. Um, that's a tough line of work because 
unlike, you know, I've worked in a hospital, people die all the time. But if you just sent your loved one on a train or on a flight, they weren't unhealthy. There was nothing expected. That's the hell of a shock that you got. And we have people who do those interviews with the family to try to figure out, you know, dental records, tattoos, whatever it is. What do they have in their pocket? Um, those interviews are incredibly hard. I would never even fathom trying to teach that online. Those skills need to be done through practice. And, and we do that training a lot. And it's I, even if you're in the audience, there's not a dry eye in the house. I mean, it's they're they're incredibly dedicated people and very gifted at, at being able to do that. But those are the kind of things that I would never recommend online training for. So again, the three types of things, tactile learning, muscle memory things, um, anything that needs direct observation and immediate feedback, and the really highly cognitive type of touchy feely issues like ethics, leadership, interviewing. So those are the kind of things that you really should not uh, try to teach online. All right, I know there were some other things I wanted to talk about. Let's see. Okay. Um, oh, we talked about training and running drills. Like I said, drills are probably the most effective thing you're gonna be able to do in this realm uh, because you're teaching people how to do repetitive uh, uh, tasks in order of precedence. And then run the drills time them, study them, watch it and see how long it takes. Look for what the problems were. Oh, we couldn't find this that I needed to do this task. Great, fix it. So you write up, as I said earlier, every time you do those drills, you study them, you write up after actions and that after action becomes your action sheet of things you need to fix. All right, we couldn't find this piece of gear. Well, then train people on where that gear is or make sure that they have access to it. Or if it, if it was under lock and key, figure out how to, you know, let people know how to do that. Um, you may, heard the term hot washing. Hot washing is right after you've completed the task. Everybody sit down and say, you know, what went right? What went wrong? Give me three up, three down. Don't make them forever. They shouldn't be painful. Just what worked? What didn't work? What could we do better? How do we rewrite the things that we do to make it happen? And, um, and I would, and again, document your process, document the lessons learned that you gathered from the hot wash, document the actions you took afterward to repair or fix or mitigate the things that went wrong. Um, there was a few other things I wanted to talk about, but well, let's do this. Let's just jump into the fun part and, uh, and get toward the end if that's okay. All right, here are your carved in stone truths. Number one, Disaster preparedness is a team sport. If you're doing it alone, you're doing it wrong. Make sure you bring in as many partners and tr truly unconventional partners. Seek out the most bizarre partners you can think of. And if they have anything to bet that benefits you, bring them back for the next meeting. If they don't, great, you, you tried. Um, success, you've heard this all already a few times. It's about the relationships. It's getting to know those people. Tabletops are beautiful for that because as the fire department and security and everybody else walks around the table and talks about what they're gonna do and your vendors, you know, here's what I can do, here's what I can't do. Uh, guess what? We don't have trucks that, that are gonna come in in high water. You find out where the gaps are. You find out where the holes are and you find out the false expectations. Oh, I thought security was gonna do this. You find those things out when you walk it through in that type of a process. Uh, so it's all about building and, and in building those, you build those relationships as well, because now your partners, once you've shared that tabletop experience, you know something about each other and you become partners. It's all about those relationships. Um, do the work before the disaster. It's great to do the work. You know, you're going to do some work during the disaster. The more you do before time, the less you'll have to do during. Um, and I mentioned, you know, don't be exchanging business cards, get to know those people on, on a, a sunny day and on a Tuesday. Uh, and here's one of those other things you hear a lot of people say bad things about in a disaster, you know, everybody, the, the nurses all left town. More people than not do the right thing. They really do. There are certainly exceptions, and that makes the headlines because somebody did something. But most people will do the right thing, and they'll do it to the level that they are trained to do. So go right back to training. If you train the people to do the tasks you need done, 
to provide for the good care and feeding of all the animals in your care, they'll do it. And it doesn't matter whether they're, your, they're you know, your clinicians, your, your volunteers, your folks, all of them will do the things you train them to do because there is a certain expectation. And when the disaster happens, people do want to help. They really do want to do the right thing. And if they can pull up that, that little sheet on the back of their ID card and says, hey, I'm supposed to do these things, they're going to do them. It will work. Um, all right, we're going to jump. There's lots of resources. These are just a few. Uh, and I want to say a couple other things. Oh, I, I'm moving it along on my screen, but not on yours. You never see it. Uh-oh, that's not good. There we go. Lots of resources. We can take some questions, and I want to get to this part. I don't know if anybody is familiar with this, but I do want to leave on this lighter note. Uh, hopefully you have seen this. If you haven't, I'll explain it. The CDC some years ago, I want to say it was 2011, was the zombie apocalypse. They created a, a comic strip, a graphic novel, if you will. I don't think they're novels. Novels are this thick, not that thick. But um, they created a comic strip about how to prepare for the zombie apocalypse. Now, this was the CDC website, Centers for the Disease Prevention, you know, et cetera, um, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But I guarantee nobody under the age of 35 ever went on the CDC website until this. And they did in such great numbers that it literally shut down the website. They had so many hits that it locked up the website. Uh, it was just a comic strip. And the comic strip talked about how to prepare for the zombie apocalypse. And it was brilliant. I know the guys who did this. And it was such a brilliant idea. You, we in the government are usually kind of stodgy and we don't get creative ideas done. They somehow got this through and they did it. It was beautiful because what it taught you in the comic strip is make sure you have batteries. Make sure you've got a few days worth of water. If you have any meds, make sure you have those. Guess what you need in a hurricane? You need the same things. It was a weird way of teaching people, especially young people who would never, ever look at disaster preparedness. It was a way to do resiliency, personal resiliency, family resiliency uh, in a way that they would absorb it. It was one, it was brilliant. I don't think it's up anymore. They've now replaced it with, uh, you know, uh, uh, viral diseases, you know, same thing, comic strips, but new ones. But this was the first. And um, I guess the lesson there is be creative. Number one, you want to, I talked about family resiliency. This kind of thing works. And the other piece is be creative in your training. If you think, okay, I'm going to write up a PowerPoint, I'm going to say, here's the things. It's not going to work. Be creative in your training. You don't have, you may not have money, but you can still do something fun, engaging, and a way in a way that's going to attract uh, your audience and engage them in this so that they'll be better at what you need them to be be good at. With that, I do believe uh, I am done. So yeah, I'll leave it on that slide just for fun. Um, we want to thank. Dr. Ted Kennedy for speaking with us this afternoon. And we just have a few questions for him um, from Slido. Um, Dr. Kennedy, regarding mental health, investigators may also be losing animals important to their studies or data points. So it's not only those implementing the plan who may be affected, but others too when the plan is activated. How is this best addressed? Answer is amen to that. And it, it is. Uh, take care of your staff. Take care of the, the people who work and are going to experience loss. Um, the best way to address that, again, is find out what your resources are for, for psychological first aid, for uh, behavioral health support, whether that's within your facility or institution. If you're part of a university, you probably have a department you can tap into, or if you have to tap into those resources within the local community or uh, remember, once that emergency operations center is stood up, if you have a request for a resource, you send it through that and they will find that resource, whether it comes from another community, it may come from a nearby state, uh, but that's, you've got to learn how to request those kind of resources, find out what's available and tap into it. Thank you. To the best of your knowledge, has the MVRT ever deployed to a non-government animal research facility. How would an institution pursue establishing a relationship with them? 
who should they contact? You want to take that one? <laughs> um, we have not, to my knowledge, but let's talk about our options. Yeah. Um, please reach out to me, um, wanda.wilsonegby at hhs.gov. Next question. Yeah, I can cover the how. The how is oh, all, all requests to the feds come from the states, but it, there's that chain between you and your state emergency operations center to get to us. So it has to be requested from the state or some major cities can direct uh, can direct request to the feds, uh, but it's going to come through your emergency operations center as a request for an ESF-8, uh, emergency support function number eight, which is health and medical uh, for support. And I would never rule out anything for being possible. Every time I say, we're never going to do this, that's what we do next. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I might have missed it, but do you have a sample or template cheat sheet? on the back of the ID card you could share? I I could probably write one up in a few minutes, but it, the bottom line, it has to come, it, two notes on that. It's gotta be specific to your plan and specific to that individual. So the person who has to work with facilities, they're gonna have those facility step-by-step -step things. Uh, the person who has to work on possibly moving animals to a different location, they're gonna have a different one. So when you're writing your plan, you write out the tasks and the responsibilities uh, that need to get performed, that becomes your your cue cards for those individuals. So those really, I wouldn't make them generic, you know, the one step of call 911 type of things or call call a particular person, call the chair of the department, whatever. Uh, but I would make those specific to the individual for their task. What metrics or indicators do you use to assess the effectiveness or your of your trainings and or exercises? So how do you validate? that the trainings have been effective? A few ways. Um, first of all, it, it, I call them short-term and long-term. So the short-term ones, and this is this is out there in literature too, short-terms are right after you've done whatever it is you've done for training, you evaluate the person. Do you think, you know, do you know more than you used to know? Did this behavior, do you think this will change your behavior? Do you think you've learned something new that you didn't know before? So those very immediate type of things. And was the format of this training appropriate? Was it too long? Was it too short? Was, you know, would it be better? Have we did it in a different form? Uh, so ask those immediate type of questions. And we have some very, very specific ones. Um, if you're ever doing training for, with um, continuing education credits, some of the accrediting bodies have very specific questions that they want evaluated in their training. So you include that, makes it easier. You don't have to write them, use theirs. Uh, and then the second piece, and this is actually the most important piece, is you have to do that long-term behavior change. So uh, if I trained you last June, but I just used you in a, a contingency drill or a real disaster, you go back and you say, hey, the training you took last June, did it help you? Did you, did you, uh, you know, subscribe to the behaviors that you were supposed to? Uh, and that's the long-term behavioral change. You should do both kind of evaluations. The rule right now doesn't require any of that that I saw, uh, but just in good conscience, do a short-term evaluation and then do a long-term evaluation either some months after the training to see if they still remember anything and would change their behaviors or right after you've done a drill exercise or a real event. <laughs> How do you gather feedback from training participants? And do you, and if you do that, how do you incorporate those in future trainings? Oh yeah, well, that's 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 it. And it's I, I concentrate on the short terms because I do those every single time. Uh, if you want to get credit for taking this course, you have to fill out an evaluation, mandate it. Uh, and it doesn't go into your training record until you fill out the eva evaluation. I know that's not necessarily required. Some CEU accreditation bodies require it, uh, but I absolutely do. You do not get credit for taking this course. It doesn't go into your training record until you fill out an evaluation. You owe me that. Uh, and that's how I collect that information. And then we have a quarterly meeting of all of our trainings where we we go through every single comment and say, okay, here's what we learned. You know, the speaker in that online course was too drab, you know, whatever, whatever you learn. And then you reincorporate that, incorporate that into the, uh, the next, you publish a report on your evaluations and then you uh, improve them for the next iteration. 
that's all the questions I have. That's it. Okay, I do have one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, I kind of touched on it a little bit, but one piece that I should have concentrated on, and that is I mentioned that people do not compete on disaster preparedness. I want to put that in big, bold letters. Uh, you could literally reach out to your competitors and collaborate on, on things. And, and I have plenty of examples of where that happened. If anybody's from Texas, you probably know the HEB uh, grocery chain store. HEB's competitors are Walmart and Walgreens and everybody else, but they collaborate on disaster preparedness because they see that their community service is more important than anything else. So literally when they're bringing stores back online, they have a conference call and say, hey, if you're bringing up this store in this neighborhood, we won't work on ours right away. We'll work on ours in another neighborhood so we get the whole community back and ready. Your competitors will actually collaborate on disaster preparedness. And your community is so small, you kind of know everybody. Uh, and in a disaster, they do want to help. Um, the last piece I'll say about that is no one out there should be writing uh, your training plans or anything else alone. There's no reason why you can't talk to each other. There's a hundred and change people on this call collaborate on developing some training you know there's no re you may not have a lot of individual resources but together you can pull off some really good stuff and a lot of the training topics are going to be exactly the same so the right way to do it is to find partners and start saying hey we need to do this let's do it together let's open a central repository for all sorts of lessons learned or training topics etc Sorry, that wanted just uh, another uh, paid co commercial announcement. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move to session six, resources and planning for the future with Dr. Jason, Jason Bellano. Thank you. All right, thanks, Wanda. Good afternoon, everyone. So we made it. We're on session six. Um, this last session for this workshop, um, there are three goals for the session. Uh, the first one is for the audience um, to specifically like ask um, if you have any lingering questions, uh, please go ahead and use the Slido link on the chat message on Zoom, um, and we will have our speakers respond to you. Um, the second goal is essentially providing a platform for asking you, um, the workshop participants, um, and certainly our speakers too, uh, for um, some more questions to further discuss the contingency planning rule. Um, and the development and implementation of contingency plans as they relate to animal care and use programs. Um, and the third one, uh, later on, Dr. Susan Harper, our committee chair, will highlight key points from the sessions and presentations today and wrap up the workshop. Um, so while we wait for um, questions to come in through the Slido link, um, I do would want to um, to take note and appreciate the presence of our speakers who stayed on for session six. Um, and again, without further ado, we can go ahead and do the Slido while we wait for the questions to come in. Um, all right. So the first question that we have for the workshop participants what of the information shared, discussed, was and were most useful to you? So it could be like, you know, the training, for example, or maybe the resources that were provided. Um, clarification from USDA. Um, can we look into this? I'm, I'm showing the second question here. What, like, what do you consider as the top challenges? Okay, so. The first question that we had was um, what information Sherry discussed was most useful or Eric. Yeah, um, okay, we apologize. Um, were we answering the second question then? 
Okay. Um, can we just go on to the second question, please? Thank you. All right, so the question, um, I apologize, uh, but the question that uh, we have on the slide now is, what do you consider as the top challenges for contingency planning? All right, so we have training, seems to be a big one. Collaboration, um, I probably would lump that, lump that with um, coordination too. Time to develop and review the 30 days. Okay. So that would um, be particularly with the training as well. Identifying stakeholders. So I'm hoping uh, for that particular one that um, with uh, the sessions this morning and also later this afternoon, that we were able to identify um, stakeholder groups that are pertinent to the creation of and development and implementation of contingency plans. Connecting with resources, all right. That would, um, I think, going to be um, relevant to collab collaboration as well. Finding time for drills. Okay. All right. All right. So really, it seems like um, the two most pertinent ones are training and collaboration and coordination. Um, can I um, connect with um, any of the speakers who can comment um, on those two? How could those challenges be addressed? Anybody? Sorry, since training is uh, the big the big print up there, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I can't stress this enough. Training doesn't stand alone. Training is directly related to your plan. If you, if you write out your plan and say, here are the tasks that we need accomplished in our contingencies, you have your training topics. It's, it's right there. Uh, and the other piece, again, do not try to do this alone. Uh, reach out to you. You've got all the points of contact for all the people on this call. Reach out to somebody you haven't dealt with before and just say, hey, you're a similar size facility with a similar mission. Can we do this together? And that's the great way to do it. And there's there are a lot of resources out there. A good uh, a good Google Google search will help a lot. Um, so yeah, steal liberally, like I said. And everybody else, remember, the rest of the community is further along on a lot of this preparedness journey than than is uh, research labs uh, for animals. Um, steal their stuff. Go to your local hospitals. Find out what they're training. Uh, so uh, you, you do have to come up with your individualized training, but you'll find that 70, 80% of it probably is the same as somebody else's. So go ahead and find it. Don't create it. Hopefully that helps. Thank you, Dr. Kennedy. Does anybody else have any thoughts? Um, one particular um, item that just pop up here actually is training sustainability too, and practical training as well. Any other thoughts? How about um, the collaboration coordination? Um, I think part of that uh, would um, be going to like the resources as well, especially like getting, um, identifying those stakeholders and then you coordinating, collaborating with them and getting um, an ac ac um, acquisition, acquiring those resources. Thoughts? If no one else is jumping in, I'll, I'll just add, yeah. uh, add one thing, and that is use it as kind of a daisy chain. When you meet a, a new you know, entity that is now one of your new partners, finish that conversation with whom else should I be reaching out to? Who else do you partner with? And that way you'll build your network. Just a thought. How do you sustain that collaboration, Mark? Dr. Kennedy, yeah. Yeah. More food. More food. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's just constant contact. Uh, again, you're going to find, especially a lot of the people in your community are already running disaster drills, things like that. Get to play along. Get in, get involved in their planning early on. Bring some of your folks in to play in those things. Have them come into your facilities. Do tours. I do tours all the time for, for our folks. 
Uh, we do right here on the on the mall. We not only do the Fourth of July, but we do uh, a thing. If anybody's familiar with, is the Peace Officer Memorial every every May fifteenth. Uh, law enforcement com uh, communities from across the country come together and memorialize those who have fallen in the line of duty in that year. Uh, it's a massive event. It's very moving to be there. But because it's right here on the mall, I can bring my budget people, my contract people, my, you know, some of our other partners, and you go and see what we do. Uh, and that keeps them engaged with us. And that works with anything. Anything you're doing, do a tour, bring some partners in. I'm I'm interested to hear from EHNS and uh, facilities management too, and um, yeah, Cook uh, representing the different stakeholders. Like, what what do you all think? How do we get you engaged in like all of this contingency planning efforts within an institution, or how in your institution, for example, how did you get engaged, if at all? Hi, this is Katia, Environmental Health and Safety. Some options for engaging EHNS and, and other partners, it, I would just reiterate what Dr. Kennedy said, is having ongoing forums where you're, you're meeting, you're talking about joint issues in general, and incorporating contingency planning drills and training as part of your ongoing work together. Um, at our institution, we, we have regular meetings with facility staff on different topics on facility staff. We have a separate emergency management department at, at our institution. And, um, and then in terms of training, for example, the trainings that we specifically lead around emergency preparedness for some of our uh, specialized programs, it helps to plan months ahead so that you can you know, pick a general timeline that works and give yourself a lot of time to plan the drills to work with all of the people that need to help develop the scenarios, even things like reserving conference rooms and in, in, in locations and in bringing people together. It helps to plan ahead as much as possible and have those forums and engage your partners as much as possible. For us, um, especially with facilities units, we know they're, they're so busy. They're always responding to issues around campus and it really falls on us to, to reach out and intentionally have those times together where we talk about just joint issues and including things like um, planning for emergencies as part of that. I would just add, coming from the facility side, you know, I mentioned it during some of my slides, I think facilities is frequent, frequently looked at as uh, adversarial and, and that's never the intent. Um, it's really important to build a partnership and uh, you know, I'll, I'll wink at Jason because we work for the same institution, but uh, you know, Jason and I have had ups and downs and we don't always agree on things, but we collaborate and we feel comfortable with each other and, and open with sharing our opinions. And uh, I understand his expertise and hopefully, uh, you know, I, I not hopefully, I know he understands mine and we kind of stay in our lanes and um, learn how to help each other instead of working against each other. Uh, those things take time. Uh, I think one of the words that popped up was staff turnover. It is something that we deal with, right? And, and it's something that I'm not sure there's an exact playbook uh, to go by, but it is kind of constantly re-going through it and having those uh, annual check-ins or what are semi-annual check-ins or biannual check-ins uh, on the policy, but also throughout the year, just collaborating on different events. I think one uh, valuable resource could be um, for there are state associations, associations of biomedical research. For example, there's an active North Carolina Association of Biomedical Research. And uh, we meet periodically where institutions from around the state and the Research Triangle Park come together. And I think that this could be an excellent working um, topic for collaboration and sharing um, you know, contingency plans and ideas for drills. So I'm, I know I'm going to be taking that to our NCABR as a possible topic. Great, thank you. Um, I, I do have a big um, follow-up question to uh, specifically this is um, pertinent to me and um, I'm very interested in this topic. And um, Dr. Razel Ludwig, um, I'm hoping that you're going to be able to answer this. Uh, one of the challenges here is um, essentially funding, although it's maybe just one person who actually said that. But 
um, like ultimately, I think um, a lot of us um, struggle to pertaining to that. Um, do you have like any comments on how your how you got your institution to support you um, providing the resources needed for contingency plans? Well, we've had, as I said, we'd had we've had disaster plans in place for many years, and for contingency plans, it just kind of like expanded on those disaster plans, SOPs, things that we had already had in place. So the structure, the framework was already there. Um, additional funding. So we did not have to request additional funding directly for the contingency plans, but funding is needed for us at the university level for our larger crisis and communications uh, section of personnel. So we have people at the university level, at the higher level, that will be our outreach, that will be our point of contact for the media when the media gets involved, that can help to be our points of contact for different local, state, and government agencies, right? So we did not need to request additional funding that was already there at the university level, but funding has had to go in to certain components of our biosafety plan, um, which part of that is going into this new UC7 that came through, um, and other granting mechanisms, right, through the government where we're saying this is going to be part of our training or this is going to be part of what we're doing whether or not it was specifically stated as being for the contingency plan. So again, I'm very lucky to be at a large enough institution that has personnel already devoted to some of these um, activities so that we did not have to specifically request funding to um, support that. But if you are at a large institution, you may still have to reach out to those people or they won't know that you need help. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Hess, you were mentioning yesterday some um, resources from like AVMA too and um, reg regarding relief and all of that. Uh, does anybody know of any other potential resources that institutions can tap into? Is there anything from like the federal government? <laughs> Well, the federal government has the resources available on many of the websites that, that have been mentioned over the last couple of days, the FEMA site and things like that, for really large overviews on um, planning and training. And I think that those have been very helpful. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So moving on to the next Slido question. Can I just can I just mention something? Um, yeah, in, please. One of the things, you know, when we're talking about collaboration, I think we, you know, you should you should consider your inspector not as your enemy, but someone who really has a lot of resources, someone who can actually bring you connections, you know, at the federal level and with other other participants as well. So so definitely. The you know in at the federal level we have a lot of people with technical expertise that can come and help you know so if you do have a question you know reach out to your inspector uh, they they definitely they are available to to help um, with any question and guidance you know thank you Dr Sabrina all right so our next question for the audience. What are your wish list items for contingency planning? And I'm opening that question up to for the speakers as well. So I think we talked about um, yesterday, this has been brought up to an example plan. Okay, dedicated time for planning, time. All right. More web sessions. So for the speakers, what do you think about um, the time? Like, seems like uh, we, 
institutions and programs in general um, don't really have like a lot of time to be dedicating um, to be dedicated to contingency planning. Example plans. Jason, I'll I'll just speak up. Um, the uh, you know t times times an issue. No matter where you're at, what organization you're involved in, and one of the things that uh, I found that makes all the difference is finding somebody, and I call them a champion. Find somebody who is passionate about the disaster side of things, the preparedness side of things in your organization and give them the reins to, to run with the program. Um, if it gets assigned to somebody uh, who's not interested or uh, somebody because they have a title um, behind their name and they're not passionate about it, the program's not going to be very effective. Thank you, Dr. Hess. Um, what about example plans here? Dr. Di Vicente, you want to respond to that? <laughs> Sure. I mean, it's. I, I think it's something that we can we can look into and see what what what's available and what what participants or what research facilities might be interested in sharing their plans. That that if we block them out, I'm I'm happy to look into that and see if that's something that we can make available. Thank you. Um, does anybody know of example plans that institutions can can utilize? Like maybe just um, you know revise and adapt to their programs. Okay, so that seems to be like, go ahead, please. All right. Yeah, there, there might not necessarily be public display plans, but if you have a friend in a similar institution than yours, you might be able to uh, ask to take a peek at theirs and things like that. So you might have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with someone who's willing to share and, you know, and you can reciprocate and be, be helpful for both. Yeah, and I'll jump in. We've we've already heard it that a lot of the uh, the larger institutions already have disaster plans in place. Just see if they'll share, and many will. Yeah, I think that's uh, certainly a good point, especially um, the. Animal research community is relatively small, like um, a lot of people know each other. Um, so, and we're all collegial. So I think um, that certainly is gonna be a good approach. One important point that I think is um, that we need to make is that there are certainly um, unique um, components of the program that's gonna have to be institutional based, um, I would think. And, and also I, I guess I would just add, and maybe maybe Dr. Serrano is about to make this point, but I guess one one challenge that we have whenever we we put something out that's a, that may be a best practice or a suggestion, uh, it's not a requirement. So the, so we the, the, we have the framework that's in the regulations that we that we've all talked about the last few days. That's what's required. And so uh, for sure, people put things in their plans that are not required. People put things in. You, we, you know, you know, at your institutions, you all do things that are not required by the regulations, uh, and so that that but that are best practices for animal welfare. And so we do have to be careful from our end of where when we when we say this is a best practice that we're that people don't take that as well. This is a new requirement. Um, so that that's sort of where we where we come from. The regulations and our tech notes give the best guidance, and then within that, we really want you guys to to. to those those requirements in your own way. Another another source and probably something that 
you know, sometimes we do have to think outside the box, especially when it comes to emergency management. You have to just really think outside and look at similar situation, even if it's not within the research community. We do have, there are so many different organizations that they do have all hazard planning, for example. I'm just thinking about the zoo and aquarium, all hazard, hazard partnership, for example. They do have specific plans on their website where basically you can actually take training, you can see the type of events. And even though it is a different situation, different type of regulated animals, but at the same time, it's sometimes they address kind of like the same issues, especially when it comes to these large emergency events. And so again, looking at, looking at outside the box and looking at other agencies, you know, other organizations that might be some, something that might help you. Right. Thank you. Um, can anybody comment on the more than 30 days uh, pertaining to the training? How can that be navigated? So, go ahead. So yesterday there were some, like some talks about like the top priorities, like um, the principles and, and all that. So maybe that will be like within the 30 days, those would be like, okay, these are the important concepts. And maybe later on would be like the nitty gritty of things. Is that like potentially an approach? Jason, I think, didn't Brian comment on how we've actually had a six day uh, for getting new hires and trained up? So I, I, I maybe think he did. wants to. Yeah, but Brian is not on the panel now. And, and I'll, I'll just say from, from our perspective, you know, we did, from the, for the USDA, we, what, when we issue a rule, we, we do a proposed rule and then solicit feedback from, from the community, from stakeholders, all sides, on all sides in the public. And this was something that was commented on the, the 30 days of um, some people thinking it's not enough, some people thinking it's it's too much. So uh, we we do feel like the 30 days is is is, is reasonable for for, for the training that, that that person needs to have at that point in time. Uh, and so, and, and I'll ask Dr. Sabrina to, to add to this if, if he wants to, but I think, you know, some of the things that you guys talked about yesterday with, with navigating that uh, are fair. And so we want people to be trained with, with what their role in the, in the contingency plan is. And so if, if your 30 day employee is not, is not, not gonna be the incident commander probably. So they, the training that they need might be different than somebody else that's that's been there for a longer period of time. But but I, I, we we feel and, and the regulations require that that there's some basic level of training for that person's role in the facility by the thirty days. All right. Thank thank you. Um, there are actually um, really good responses on this particular question. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through each and every single one of those, but what we will do is to have like all of this responses um, sent over to um, USA and perhaps discussed within the committee here. Um, so we can- Jason, further... I have one more, sorry to interrupt you there, just a, a good yeah. resource for people regarding the example plans. I just checked one of the pages I thought I remembered on the ALAS website under IACUC resources, there's a disaster preparedness section that has example institutional plans from real institutions that people can go to, look to see what's in their area and use those as example plans for helping to develop their own. All right, thank you for providing that. Um, so regarding the training, how do you address training and engagement of new employees from the different stakeholder groups like EHS, facilities management, um, regarding the contingency plans. Um, and then the follow-up question to that is, does this responsibility fall on the owner of the plan, um, the owner being quotation marks, um, or the leaders or the heads of the different stakeholder groups? And how is it addressed? How is it best addressed? Dr. Kane, you can respond and then we can, um, I, uh, Carrie, not Carrie, sorry, um, uh, Mr. Lance, uh, Ms. Harb, if you can respond a little bit later on to that, that'll be great. Thank you. 
Yeah, I just, I, you really do have to consult with USDA on that one because most cases you're only responsible for training the people who are on your staff in your plan. If you have partners, they may have roles, but they don't necessarily have responsibilities outlined in your plan. That's usually the case, but USDA uh, would have to take the, the ruling on that one. So, so again, it's it's a performance outcome that the, whoever is involved in your planning needs to be needs to be trained for the, their role in the plan. And so, I think we're mostly we're not going to go ask the, the the police department if they were trained, um, but we might ask what the connection is and and how how you made that that how you thought to foster that relationship. Um, but, but I think the, the the emphasis is on the facility training their own staff. Training. So, you know, we, we've sent all of our folks, uh, again, I'm answering from a facilities perspective, right? So all of our folks undergo uh, animal training on a cadence. We're trying to make it annual. Uh, during my presentation, I shared that this is somewhat, uh, that the School of Medicine is somewhat new to us. So I've kind of have a, a, an interesting and somewhat unique perspective, I guess, being in academic medicine and spending most of my time on the healthcare side where you know, there has been incident command system training that the NIMS incident command system training, and we implement our incident command system multiple times throughout the year. We tabletop, we drill. Uh, we haven't quite done that as much on the school of medicine side. So I think there are some best practices that may be able to be shared, not necessarily from a facilities management perspective, but perhaps at the emergency management perspective, as there are representatives on each side. Um, but in terms of responding to, you know, critical issues, you know, we do train our frontline staff uh, on response to, uh, to to animal areas and things that they need to be mindful of and things they can do and not do and when they need to ask for help. I mean, in from our, our perspective, uh, we do drills a combination of ways for uh, our animal facility specifically, um, the drills and, and training is conducted by the animal facility personnel in general. When we have drills and in, in training related to hazardous materials, incident response, um, we have the a, a team that could respond to uh, emergencies involving hazardous materials. Uh, our EHS department leads those drills in coordination with our animal facility staff. They're actually coincidentally drilling uh, this week uh, on, on response and, and training. And then when we have campus level, because we have two medical centers, we have research, we have teaching, when we have campus-wide drills and drill planning, those are generally led by uh, our emergency management department. And then they bring in all of the different departments to help with scenarios and, and response. And we implement the, the full incident command structure. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, there was a comment on the uh, Slido um, indicating that somebody found a template plan on the NH website. Um, so we can try to look into that. Um, and then if people are interested, we can send a link um, to that. Um, obviously you can do your own Google search as well. Um, there is a question um, and anybody from the panel can respond to this. How visible or how widely shared should a facility's contingency plan be? I would say that would depend on the level of security you need for your facility. Um, it's great to be able to share your plans, but in some cases, there are some things, uh, especially if you have select agents at your facility, that cannot be widely shared. Yeah, as a federal disaster person, I would I would echo that. It's great to share within your community with the people you know, uh, but I certainly wouldn't post it on a website. Uh, there are people out there who mean to do us harm and mean to do you harm. Uh, so be cautious of those types of things. Would you share it with the research, uh, the, the researchers or? 
yeah, the people working in your facility, yeah. absolutely, they they need to know it because they need to live it. Um, but the, you can also require some confidentiality if there is some some element of that uh, plan that you don't want shared outside, or if your researchers work for different organizations. So you can do those types of things. Um, but again, the answer is is as always, it depends. I actually just uh, thought of this question. Um, what do you all think of um, the satellite facilities? Like, do they have to have their own disaster plan? Um, or is that going to have to be part of the entire plan too? Like, how did you, um, Dr. Russell Ludwig, um, perhaps you have like satellite facilities over in your, or uh, Dr. Hina, um, have, like, I keep satellite? getting to answer in the negative. We don't have satellite facilities either. We have one large, unless you count the university as a whole, and then potentially the TNPRC would be a satellite facility of the university as a whole. And we have our own separate disaster plan from the um, animal care facilities on the main campus. We're in two different cities. And I think that if you are geographically disparate in some way, that having a more detailed um, disaster plan or contingency plan for your specific area would be beneficial. Um, you're going to have different resources that are needed in different areas. But I do not have a specific satellite facility from mine to have that experience. Okay, thank you for the comment. Yeah, any thoughts? Um, just from a personal perspective at, at my institution, we have I think three satellite facilities, and we do require each of them to have, um, you know, we've drafted an SOP of items they have to cover, and they are required to complete that and then um, have that on file during inspections and also provide a copy with um, our Division of Comparative Medicine and to update it when there are new personnel. So it, it works with our overall institutional plan, but it's required for each independent satellite facility. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Yeah, we have a number of satellites in my current institution, and part of the deal of getting a satellite is you have to feel, have the compliance plan. But the the uh, Vivarium provides them with sort of an outline and a number of questions in that to help the the scientists actually answer all the the things that are, are needed in the compliance plan. So that happens. And it's uh, updated every three years or so, or as needed. Yeah. Just to throw in an additional thought, it's just important, I'm sure many people already know this, to make sure that uh, all the uh, emergency plans or continuity plans are integrated with each other. So your facilities needs to be integrated with your institution, the institutions has to be integrated with the region, the region with you know, the state or whoever it might go up to. So. There might be individual plans, but again, they all have to be consolidated or integrated with themselves or with each other, rather. That's a very good point, Leslie. Um, all right, so this would be the last question before I turn it over to Dr. Harbour. Can training be staged by role within the facility? Like scientists, study directors who do not have hands-on with animals be trained to the overview, and then those in animal areas have more hands-on critical training. Yeah, I'll take that one. And, and the, the answer is absolutely. Again, it goes right back to what are their tasks. So you need to train each individual to whatever their tasks and responsibilities are in your plan. Uh, so obviously, people are going to have different levels. If, you, if somebody is you're going to designate as your facility incident manager, they're going to need an awful lot of training and hopefully have some background in that as well. Um, but if it's just a general an animal handler, they may have a very limited role, very limited responsibilities, and that's all you need to train them in. Great, thank you um, to all the panelists. Um, Eric, can we go to the first question on the slide, please? Um, so while Dr. Harper um, proceeds with wrapping up the workshop, um, I'm hoping that uh, the audience can actually participate in this poll. Um, what of the information shared discussed was or were most useful to you. 
um, I think this is certainly important for us as a committee um, to know exactly what your thoughts are regarding the topics that were covered in, during the workshop. Dr. Harper. Okay, thank you. Um, so this brings us to the conclusion of the workshop. And from my perspective, it's been an amazing two days. Our speakers and panelists were incredible, and we've been able to view the big world of contingency planning through a lot of different lenses. On the first day, we learned about some of the factors that led up to this workshop, and we also gained some insight into the challenges that impact stakeholders by reviewing the results of two national surveys that were conducted by FASIB and um, also this workshop committee. During the afternoon, we heard how different organizations and disciplines approach contingency planning and some of the complicated factors that must be considered during the development of plans and also to successfully manage events that require plans to be activated. Today, we learned how the various individuals who have roles and responsibilities tied to the animal program can work together and co contribute to the contingency planning process. And I wanna thank all of our speakers who participated as panelists and graciously shared their knowledge, experience, and ideas with us on how we can be more efficient and effective members of that team. One of the important messages that I wanted to highlight is that we heard how important these relationships and partnerships can be during an event. And as one of our speakers noted, you can't fight a wildfire all by yourself. And this afternoon, we had a dynamic and extremely informative in se uh, session on training programs uh, that really motivated us and reinforced and clarified a lot of the contingency planning concepts and principles that we've heard over the past two days. Um, I should disclose that, that that speaker promised you a set of steak knives. There are no steak knives. Um, so don't let that affect your rating of this <laughs> workshop, please. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience. The questions and the level of participation and interest has been extremely gratifying. And even though we're not all in the same room, we could sense that there's a lot of enthusiasm and passion for this topic. And so we would like your feedback to keep that momentum going. Uh, please be watching for a post-event questionnaire. You should be receiving an invitation by email right after the workshop. And I think that there's also a link in the chat that you can use, is that correct? Okay. Um, uh, so we sincerely value your thoughts and ideas, and please take the time to let us know what other types of workshops you'd like to see in the future. And it would be a great oversight on my part if I did not acknowledge the efforts of this committee, um, all the members and the academy staff that Leslie and I worked with. It's been an extreme pleasure um, during the planning of this workshop. We appreciate all of your hard work and your patience. <laughs> I have to add that in. And our, um, we're both very proud and grateful to have been part of this group. So thank you very much. And with that, I will hand it back to Mia for her final comments. So. I'd like to add my thanks to Susan's and thank you all for attending and participating in our contingency planning and training of personnel rule AFIS-2020-0101 one year of implementation workshop. We are at the close of our workshop and I do want to express my gratitude to each one of you all for your active participation and your contributions these past two days. Our discussions on the implementation of the AFIS contingency rule have been both stimulating and thought provoking. Throughout this workshop, we delved into very critical aspects of implementing effective contingency plans, and hopefully we are leaving here today not just with a deeper understanding, but also with a renewed commitment to enhance our practices and policies for the betterment of animal health. As we move forward, I would encourage everyone to continue to apply the lessons learned and to support each other in our endeavors. If you're interested, and viewing the recording for the workshop, it will be posted and available on our National Academy's workshop webpage. The final product of this workshop will be a proceedings in brief, and that will be available to download from the roundtable on the science and welfare of animals involved in research webpage. We will make sure to have that link available for everyone. So thank you again for your interest and your attendance, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>